Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about Bayesian parameter estimation in a normal model. Uh, before we get started, there is a PDF version of these slides down below. There's also a previous video that also talked about Bayesian parameter estimation in a bit more detail, so you might want to check that out. I'll try to put a link up here. All right, so as a quick reminder about how Bayesians do parameter estimation, the Bayesians use Bayes' rule. And in this Bayes' rule formula right here, what we are representing is that theta are the unknown parameters, y are, is the data. And so uh, with this formula, we've given each of these terms in this formula a name. On the left side of the equality, we have the posterior distribution. Uh, really, in this formula, it's the posterior probability density function. Then on the right side, we have the py given theta. That is the model. That's multiplied by the prior probability density function. And in the denominator, we have the prior predictive distribution. And as a reminder, that prior predictive distribution can be determined from the terms in the numerator if we integrate out the parameter theta. Now, for this particular video, we are going to be talking about a normal model. And so what that means is that means that the model in this equation is the model for normal random variables. And then typically, uh, typically we're going to be talking about having a collection of normal random variables. So we could modify these statements that we have in this equation right here if we were to replace theta by mu and sigma squared, or mu comma sigma squared. And specifically, if we're going to replace the model probability density function with the normal probability density function, and probably for a collection of normal data, as we will see in a second. All right, so that's the brief uh, reminder of what Bayesian parameter estimation's goal is. Now let's apply it to that normal model. So we suppose that we have observations from a normal distribution. Those observations are independent. They all have a common mean mu and a common variance sigma squared, which means their standard deviation is sigma. And now in order to use the formula on the previous page, the one term that we have not defined is what that prior distribution is for a normal model, right? So we need a distribution, a probability density function for mu and sigma squared before we see the data. So it turns out that the sort of widely accepted default prior to use in this circumstance is this right here. Now on the left side, right, we have the notation for the prior distribution for mu and sigma squared. On the right side, we just have one over sigma squared uh, with an implied uh, range on that sigma squared of positive real values because we know that variances have to be positive. But now, interestingly, we see this proportionality symbol. We don't see any quality, right? So that uh, sort of alpha-looking symbol or fish-looking symbol, that's the proportionality symbol. And the reason that that's there is because it turns out that this prior is not actually a probability density function. And it's not a probability density function because its integral is not finite, and in particular, its integral is not 1, right? And we know that all probability density functions have to be uh, have an integral of 1. And the problem is, because the integral is infinite, uh, we cannot simply renormalize to make sure that it does integrate to 1. That is, it will always integrate to infinity, no matter what kind of constant we try to put up front. And so this is kind of a weird uh, density, and therefore uh, it doesn't have a distribution uh, unlike all the other distributions we've seen before. Now, it turns out with the mathematics that that's actually not a problem. Well, it's not too big of a problem, let's say. And it turns out that we can go ahead and we can derive a posterior distribution for these parameters. Here, I'm showing you the marginal posterior distributions for each of the parameters. So on the left side, we see the posterior for the mean parameter mu. That happens to have a generalized student's t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, location y bar, and scale s divided by the square root of n. You'll note here in my notation, I always square that as the second term in that t, uh, in the parameters for the t. On the right side, we see the posterior distribution for the variance. That turns out to be an inverse gamma distribution with shape parameter n minus 1 over 2 and its scale parameter n minus 1 times the sample variance divided by 2. So I probably should have put this up earlier, right? But the terms that describe all of those posterior distributions, or both of those posteriors, 
right, are these three uh, terms that we can calculate from the data, or three statistics that we can calculate from the data. N is the sample size, Y bar is the sample mean, and S squared is the sample variance. All right, let's talk a little bit more about each of these individual posterior distributions. So the posterior for the mean parameter mu, again, is this generalized student's t with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, location, y bar, and scale s divided by the square root of n. And it, from the properties of the generalized student's t distribution, which if you haven't seen it, you can go back and watch the video that will be put up here, or a link, a card, will be put up here to that video. But from the properties, we can determine that the posterior expectation of mu is actually y bar. And now this is only valid when the number of observations is greater than two. And we can also determine that the posterior variance here is n minus one times that tuple variance divided by n minus three, and again divided by n, right? And that uh, turns out to be only valid for n greater than three. All right, so, um, the last thing that we know from this generalized student's t is that we can sort of standardize it and get a standard t distribution if we subtract off that location parameter and we divide by that scale parameter. We are going to use this relationship at the bottom here, the standard t, to construct credible intervals. All right, so uh, here is the formula to construct a credible interval. It's going to be for a 100, 1 minus a percent credible interval. As a reminder, that a is going to be the error rate. And so typically a is relatively small, that is it's close to zero. So we might want something like a 95% interval, in which case a would be 0 0.05. So the credit formula for the credible in interval is this formula right here. It's y bar plus or minus this t thing that I'll talk about in a second, times that scale parameter s divided by the square root of n. And basically, this is using that idea of a location scale t distribution, right? We're scaling it by the scale parameter and we're shifting it by that location parameter. And now the question is, how do we get that t value? We're gonna call that a t critical value. And the notation here is that the first piece indicates the degrees of freedom, so that's n minus one, and the second piece tells us something about the probability. And what it tells us is that we want the probability for a t random variable, that's that capital T with n minus one degrees of freedom, to be less than this t critical value. We want that probability to be equal to one minus a over two when that random t has a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. And when we have that t critical value, then the formula up here will be a valid 95% credible interval for mu, okay? And so we will interpret that as our belief is with 95% probability, if it's a 95% interval, our belief is that the true value is within that interval with probability 0.95. All right, so let's get move on. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna get an example of this T critical value. This T critical value here, uh, in this example, we're gonna have, say, n was 10, and suppose we want a 95% interval, so that means that a is 0 0.05. Then we can compute this t critical value by using the qt function in R. So we just put the uh, error rate first, that one minus a over two, uh, or what this probability is going to be equal to, a, one minus a over two, and we put in the degrees of freedom of n minus one and then we get that t critical value that we can use now in constructing these credible intervals. All right, now let's look back over at the variance. So as a reminder, the posterior for the variance is an inverse gamma. If you don't know about the inverse gamma, you should take a look at the video up here. The inverse gamma is, this particular inverse gamma is going to have a shape parameter n minus one over two and a scale parameter n minus one times the sample variance divided by two. And now we can use properties of the inverse gamma distribution to find that the posterior expectation for the variance is n minus one times that sample variance divided by n minus three. And again, this is now only valid for n greater than three. And we can also find that if we take the inverse, so instead of looking at sigma squared, we look at one over sigma squared and we look at its posterior, its posterior will have a gamma distribution. There's also a video that I have about the gamma distribution. I probably won't link it up there. As a reminder, there's two different ways to 
uh, parameterize the gamma distribution. The one we're using here is where that second parameter is the rate parameter. Okay, And we're going to use this uh, relationship to find a credible interval for the inverse gamma. All right, so as a reminder, for the credible interval, for an equal tail credible interval, we need this relationship. That is, we need to find an L and a U, such that the probability of being less than L is A over 2, and the probability of being right or larger than U is also A over 2. All right, so that's what we need to find. And now it turns out what we're actually going to do is we're going to find, uh, we're going to take those equations, those probabilities, and we're going to invert the equations inside of them. So instead of sigma squared, we're going to have 1 over sigma squared, which means that we have 1 over L. And when we do the inverse like that, uh, note that everything is positive here, but when we do that inverse, we're going to have to switch the inequality. So if you notice, the inequality up on the first one is less than, but the inequality in the second one, the second line is greater than. For the inequality for u, right, we now have and switch 1 over sigma squared and 1 over u, and we have to switch that inequality, so we go from a greater than sign now to a less than sign. And so what this means is that we can find what this 1 over L and 1 over U are using the gamma distribution in R, and then we will just invert those endpoints, and we will now have a credible interval for an inverse gamma. So here's a function in R that will do that calculation for you. You can see that we're getting the quantiles of an inverse gamma, and we're going to use the quantiles of a gamma to find those. And you can see where it has the 1 divided by, that's this inverse operation we're doing. And you'll notice the other piece that we have is that we're going to put in a probability, and then in the inverse gamma formula we have 1 minus p. And the reason for that is because of the shifting of these inequalities. Right? That shifting of the inequalities is represented in our code by that 1 minus p. All right. Now, the variance is not a very interpretable quantity, because whatever the units are, for the data, that is for the y's that we've uh, collected, the units for the variance are always that unit squared. And this turns out to be pretty hard to interpret. And so what we often are interested in is having a uh, posterior or having information about the standard deviation rather than the variance. Now the standard deviation is just the square root of that variance. And because we're taking the square root, and because the units on the variance were squared, when we take the square root, our units now are actually the same units as the data that we collected. All right? And so uh, it's nice to use that uh, standard deviation for interpretability as opposed to variance. But now, how do we get the same kinds of quantities that we had before? So I'm going to focus here on those credible intervals. So the credible intervals, we can find uh, the endpoints for the credible interval for the standard deviation simply by taking the square root of the endpoints of the interval for the variance. Right? And we can do that because of this equation right here. Right? This equation just says, look, if we have the variance and we know that the probability that that variance is less than uh, a particular cutoff, say, squared, right? we know that that's equal to the probability of taking the square root of both sides. And we can do that right? because everything here is positive. When we take that square root, we have the probability that the standard deviation is less than c. And so that means that when we go to find a credible interval for the standard deviation, we can simply take the square root of the endpoints for the credible interval for the variance. Now I want to mention, this is also true for any quantile, in particular for the median. So in the future video, the next video, we're actually going to show you using this to find the posterior median for the standard deviation. All right, so um, the other thing we're going to use in the next video is we're going to use the density for this standard deviation, which is going to be a, the density for the square root of an inverse gamma random variable. And it turns out we can do something called the transformation of random variables, which is beyond the scope of this video. Uh, but if we do, we can find the PDF for this square root of an inverse gamma. And that PDF here is given sort of in two parts in R code. The first part finds the uh, density for inverse gamma, and then the second function finds the density for that square root of an inverse gamma. All right, so that was sort of all the mathematics behind Bayesian inference, maybe default Bayesian inference in a normal model. Uh, 
the next video is going to walk through a real world example of using all of these formulas in that context. I hope to catch you there.